hard and fast rules about changes you might make to the practice or how you want your practice to look to make it child friendly. But you might begin by looking at your practice through the eyes of a child. For example, here's the reception desk in our university eye clinic. So this is how the clinic would appear to an adult approaching the desk at the start of the whole process of an eye examination. But this is what a child would see from the same standpoint. A very, very different impression. And if However ridiculous this may, might sound, you begin by getting down on your hands and knees and looking at the place from a small child's perspective. You might begin to get an idea of changes you'll want to make to make the whole experience more interesting or less disturbing for a young child. Think as well about the equipment that's going to be on show when the child enters the testing room. Is the equipment very frightening? If you're not going to use this particular piece of equipment, can you put it somewhere else, hide it behind a screen or even move it to a different room? On the other hand, is the equipment that on display appealing to inquisitive little fingers? Is the child going to think, oh, goody, a remote control? Or maybe it's a mobile. Mummy lets me play with her mobile. I'll play with this. You might want to think then about rearranging the equipment in your room. Now, if you only see children occasionally, that might not be feasible. But some practices like to reserve an entire session each week for children. And that makes it more viable to make rather larger changes to where your equipment is on those days. You don't need to make big changes to make the practice look appealing to a child. Here, we've just got some friendly looking stickers on a bin and a couple of pictures on the walls that might only be temporary. You might also like to think about what you wear on the sessions when you're seeing young children and what impression you're giving the child. You might normally wear a suit and tie and you might think about how that might look to a child and how your clothing can give a more welcoming appearance. So at the start of the examination, we're going to take history and symptoms. Now, when we're dealing with small children, of course, it's going to be the parent or the carer who's going to answer your questions. But try and involve the child as much as you can. You can address the questions to the child, even if it's mum who answers the questions and that if nothing else will stop the child from getting bored while you and mum are talking about them. When mum tells you her concerns think about what the words mean because words have different meanings to different people. Take the word squint for example. If mum tells you that she's worried that her child is squinting occasionally to us, that might mean the child's eye is turning because we tend to use the word squint to mean strabismus. But does mum mean something else? She may mean squinting as screwing up your eyes. And that is an entirely different symptom. Remember also that some people, including us sometimes, get left and right mixed up. So if mum's telling you that she has a concern about her child's right eye. Make sure you know which eye. Does she mean right from the child's perspective or right from her perspective looking at the child? And if the child's had a previous eye test, whether in practice or in hospital, find out what mum already knows about the child's eyes. And use the same words when checking or noting down, use mum's words. So at the end, 
when you address her concerns, you're speaking the same language, you're using the same words back to explain your findings. The younger the child, the shorter their attention span is likely to be. And children with special needs may very well have a short attention span as part of their difficulties. So remember that you are unlikely to be able to proceed systematically through all of the stages of an eye examination such as you would deliver to an adult. So we need to prioritise. We need to begin with the most important tests and leave the other tests that have less significance for this particular case until towards the end when it's less important if the child is not attending. But what is important will of course depend on the concerns the parents is voicing. So the order of your tests may be different for different children. Secondly, you need to think about how the child is feeling. Is the child particularly nervous and shy? In that case, it might be entirely inappropriate, in spite of the concerns, to begin with visual acuity, which require the child to actually talk to you. And visual acuity may best be left for a little while until the child has settled and has relaxed and is more willing to talk. On the other hand, you might have a child who's very excited about this new adventure and is not going to want to sit still for some of the passive objective tests straight away. So for that child, visual acuity may very well be a good place to start to involve them immediately. And then when they're feeling a little calmer, go on to the more objective tests. Young children are unlikely to have a, a good perception of time and we don't want a child to get frustrated because at the end of the very first procedure they think you've finished and they're told, no, back in the chair please because we've got lots more to do. So one of the things you might consider is a way of explaining to the child what you will be doing. Some practitioners will use a picture board and pictures which can be moved around, perhaps stuck on with Velcro, to allow you to change the order depending on the child uh, and explain to the child each bit beforehand and then they will realise how much longer they've got to be with you and when they've got to the real end of the tests. <laughs>